summer wild boar stalking. The challenge is to hunt for on foot at night using thermal in a heat wave. Warm ball. It is very warm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's extremely warm. <laughs> is it raining pigeons? Essex gamekeeper Jeff Garrett is on crop protection, shooting from under a brolly. Nice bit of shade from the sun. Pigeons uh, are not taking too much notice of it. I'll give you a shout in about two hours time and let you know exactly how it's getting on. Blue fin tuna are back. Deborah Hatfield finds out how anglers are keeping it that way, including one who reckons it's a British victory. Once Brexit happened, we became an independent registered state with the global tuna authorities and last year was the first season we were allowed to go out and catch blue fin tuna. Plus, Browning versus Franchi. Ian Hodge points to two semi-autos and says which one he would buy and why. We're giving away Vario hearing protection price at £150. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. New shooting tech means fresh hunting possibilities and uh -huh. adventures. Tonight we're trailblazing in the Portuguese countryside. Our friend Sergio Couto wants to find out if he can offer his hunting clients the opportunity to stalk wild boar at night. It's never been done here before. Nobody does that. Some people may think they've done it, but they can shoot a boar on the way to their stand. It's not necessarily stalking, okay? We are actually physically looking for boar in the dark. He knows the pigs are here and in big numbers, but can he get hunters within shooting range of the wild boar? And secondly, will the infrared thermal units, which rely on contrasting heat signatures, pick them out well enough in the Portuguese summer heat? Step forward, Paul Donagani from Infrared UK. Um, menu, we're going to go straight down into zero in. Although Paul didn't expect to be shooting, he's been told he is. Plus, he's to set up the rifles in the midday sun with no time to acclimatise. It's warm, Paul. It is very warm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's extremely warm. <laughs> We're actually bad. I think I've got burnt. We've only been outside the car for two and a half <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Literally saw the smoke coming off your arm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very warm. So yeah. we're cooking and we've decided to come out to Portugal and test thermal. Yeah. Is it going to work? Yes. I, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, everyone says that you can't use thermal when it's really hot. So we thought we could to, <laughs> we thought we could to Portugal where it's 40 degrees. <laughs> it's going to be challenging. Which it always is when I'm with you, actually, David. <laughs> every, every time I've come out, there's always a challenge. But that's what makes it fun, isn't it? I mean, that's the, that's the good thing about being out here with field sports. What we'll do is we'll get the uh, get the scope zeroed on the two rifles, and then we're going to get out tonight and, and see if we can get a ball. So that's the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Confident. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> They've mounted the TH50 thermal scope on an unmoderated 270 and the TD50L night vision scope Andy Crow uses on bunnies on the little Bagara single shot takedown rifle. With rifles and scopes on song and Paul on the after sun, it's time for food, not us, the wildlife. The ground we'll be hunting on is 2,000 hectares of open countryside, no fences. The feeding regime costs a fortune, but it benefits all game. Tiago has a few uh, feed stations like that, all scattered around the ground. They are all automatic, so instead we, we have to come over here and put it physically all the time, making noise, is why you notice the boar are quite relaxed. Yeah. So the way is, if it's that just maze, and the boar and the deer, they all feed from here, and everything else comes with it, the hares and everything. So that's at about 7.30, 8 o'clock, every day spins for 10 seconds. 10 seconds can, can throw out a lot of maize. Yeah. And what that makes is, instead of being in a pile, all the boar eating one place and go, they have to scatter around and make them stay here a little bit longer. Yeah. Tiago and Sergio are also trying to establish a wild partridge shoot here. 
the pig versus partridge food fight is a little unfair, so Tiago has invented his own boar unfriendly feeding station. These spikes is try to prevent the, the boar to come and steal from the, the feed because the boar can be a bit destructive. That's just for the wild partridge to be able to, to get feed, so that's the hopper, as you see. And, and here is 100% wild bird, there's no throwing population, there's no breeding. What we have here is totally wild. With the stage set, it's time for our food and some rustic Portuguese hospitality. Now, because the tech has moved faster than the law, Sergio has invited us at a particular time of the month. He still needs to abide by outdated Portuguese regulations, which state we can only shoot during the 10 nights leading up to the full moon. That's obviously sensible with good old glass, but now defunct with digital kit. Yeah. They go with a tractor neck to the road, I'll yeah. show you. And they'll plough it, yeah. just to leave like, so if someone throws a cigarette, then they'll catch fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. En route to feed more animals before dark, Sergio stops to look at the damage a recent wildfire has caused. Southern Europe has been hit hard this year, and in some areas, the countryside has been completely shut down to all, including hunters. The guys think this is ridiculous. Just like gamekeepers in the UK, they're the ones who spot an emergency before it becomes one. We used to have a minister before that was all about for the hunters to be in the countryside, because if we are out, we are the first ones to see the signs of fire, and we'll be the first one, the first responsers, or the first phone call would be made by a hunter. Um, the latest one is not so happy about that, um, for every many reasons. So yes, hunters had a big benefit to be in the wild for the prevention, and that's very important. As we're here for wild boar, we'd better get to know our quarry. These boar are not wild and therefore not camera shy. The images through the infrared scope and the spotters are really good. Identifying a boar at our self-imposed maximum shooting range of about 100 metres won't be a problem. Slowly we edge down to a plateau where the wild boar have been feeding. At this point we stop and look down across where we were spreading maize earlier on. There are pigs along the tree line. Sergio stays put and will coordinate from the vantage point. Working the wind, Tiago guides Paul. There's a heat signature, but not enough. We think it's gone. Then it offers a shot. Paul takes it, but in the moment doesn't press record. David, using Paul's infrared FH35 spotter, reacts at the shot. As we came over the brow bit here, it was just standing out in front of us. And as we got onto it with the scope, it just stepped into the brush. We were waiting for it to come out and uh, give it a broadside shot. So I had record on, turn record off to wait for it to come out. And as it came out, because it only gave us a split second, forgot to press record. <laughs> Shot. <laughs> we haven't recorded it. But we're hoping it's going to be dead just over there. So we're just going to give it a minute or two for it all to settle. And then hopefully we can go over and, and find the ball. With everyone happy the shot was good, they head to the tree line to look for our ball. Even with all our chat, there are pigs moving through the cover just yards from us. Uh, it's like a proper piggy motorway, isn't it? <laughs> Every two seconds, there's a load of ball going through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. 
Wow. That's two pigs down. Right, aye. Dad, yeah. It's a nice young boar, and once again, Paul got caught up in the moment. A snapshot taken with no record button pressed on the thermal unit. For more sensitive viewers, we can't repeat what David said at the time. They say that it doesn't work in the heat. We proved them wrong. One, two, three, go! It's Paul's first ever wild boar, Sergio's first successful Portuguese wild boar stalk, and a good test of kit that he hopes will offer hunters something completely different. Just managed to get an opportunity with a little V in the gap. It was about, I don't know, two foot, and as it came over, it stopped for a second. We managed to squeeze a shot off, so yeah. <laughs> really good. <laughs> yeah. It all happened really quickly, didn't it? Yeah. And that's the difference between stalking. It is, is, yeah, yeah, for sure. So if you were if you were sitting on a on a on a high seat or on a Well even a hut. even stalking wise, you know, they're just totally different. I mean we've been out what? We we went out about ten and yeah. I think we stalked pretty <laughs> Yeah, for the long start. We've come back with a couple of opportunities uh, uh, which sort of presented us. We went down and the wind changed again and back on it again and yeah, he did a fantastic job. The boy knows his stuff. I was a guinea pig. <laughs> <laughs> good, good one. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, we proved that it does work and, and certainly the infrared stuff worked perfectly. So, great. Well, thanks, thanks, guys. What a great evening. Tiago recovers Paul's first ball the following morning, just 20 metres from where we'd been chatting. If you'd like to be a trailblazer too and enjoy a four-night, three-day wild boar stalking and high-seat experience in Portugal with Sergio and Tiago, it costs £1,700 all-inclusive, plus flights. There are no limits on board, no trophy fees, and they will supply infrared scopes if you haven't got one. If you do want one, a tube TH50 is priced at around £4,000 and by heading to kitfinder.co.uk you can sniff out a fair deal from the UK gun shops with stock. To make life even easier, just scan the QR code on the screen or click the link in the description below for a preloaded search. Thank you Sergio and Tiago for fixing that trip and to Paul for being our subject. And I'm glad to say that Kit Finder is working well. It's handled 1,200 requests for shooting kit since we launched it two weeks ago. Gun shops are doing their best to keep up with the demand. You are sending them. One of them, Mark Singlehurst from gun shop Vale Field and Game, saw a request for a Digex C50 on Kit Finder on the Friday and responded with a price of £950 plus free post and packing. The customer paid on Sunday, he posted it on Monday and it was delivered into the customer's hands on Tuesday morning. He kindly wrote to say, Kit Finder is easy to use and we are delighted with the ease of the customer journey. Thank you, Mark. Next up, our very own bag for life. It is David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Her Royal Highness Princess Anne presented honours at the 2022 Game Fair in memory of her late father, Prince Philip. The Princess Royal presented two new awards to commemorate the Duke of Edinburgh's patronage of Basque. She gave the awards to Jonathan Young and Colin Tigo. Jonathan, a former editor of The Field, was honoured for his national contribution to shooting and conservation. Colin, who's a warden for Basque, was recognised for his outstanding commitment to the Lindisfarne wildfowling scheme. Princess Anne took the opportunity to visit several stands at the fair and meet a range of people. Um, she just gets it, just knowledgeable on a lot of subjects. Yeah, brilliant. Shooting is part of the everyday. We have everything from dustbinmen to dukes that take part in shooting in the UK. So yeah, it's great. I and mean, we, are, we are the British countryside, all of us. Staying with the game fair, and this was one of the worst years for thefts. Thieves took this yellow cocker bitch. She's called Ivy and has a white chest and was taken from the back of a vehicle. There's a £5,000 reward. A link to Ivy's page on the Dog Loss website is in the description below. 
Meanwhile, thieves followed the owner of the House and Waco shooting fashion label back to her hotel and stole her stock from her van. The distinctive bags and accessories should be easy to spot. Anti-hunting media are claiming that Tory leadership hopeful Rishi Sunak is promising to ban the importation of hunting trophies to the UK. The Independent reports the Tory leader hopeful has pledged to champion the animals abroad bill, which the government dropped in the spring. The news website quotes a reply from Sunak's team saying Rishi looks forward to championing the bill as it continues to progress through Parliament, adding that he is committed to banning the import of hunting trophies from thousands of species, as well as live exports. We approached Sunak's campaign team for confirmation. So far, we've had no reply. Liz Truss's team has yet to make a comment about the issue. The Express newspaper reports that at a hustings exchange in Exeter, she pledged not to change Blair's ban on hunting with dogs. I think that the tragedy is that sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world have made a pretty strong case of how valuable hunting tourism is to uh, rural communities, to wildlife conservation, to allow people to work and live with wildlife. And it, to me, it, honestly, it just seems like it, it's, it's cheap politics. Meanwhile, on the other side of the political divide, a senior Labour politician has pledged his support for shooting sports. Shadow Food, Farming and Fisheries Minister and Labour MP for Cambridge, Daniel Zeichner, has been in Parliament since May 2015. He was one of Charlie's guests at the Carter Jonas Game Fair Theatre at the weekend. During the interview, he shared his views on a range of field sports and countryside issues. Very interested to see the, um, the work that's being done on, on phasing out lead shot. Uh, we had a discussion on this in Parliament when the Environment Bill was going through. Um, I would be keen to see it happen more quickly, but it was being explained to me some of the technical difficulties with the ammunition manufacturers. They're moving to much better systems and that's to be welcomed and I think what, it, this, what this shows is that if you work um, in dialogue and in partnership you can move um, in a direction that works for everybody. The police service for Northern Ireland has declared a critical incident for its firearms licensing department. It made the decision due to huge backlogs in processing grants and renewals which can take up to a year. A critical incident is defined as any incident where the effectiveness of the police response is likely to have a significant impact on the confidence of the victim, their family or the community. There are currently around 3,000 applications waiting to be processed. Police blame delays on a lack of resources and IT problems caused by the introduction of a new computer system which processes applications. You're probably aware that Dover Port declared a critical incident fairly recently. And that's interesting because it means that there are different aspects of government who can declare critical incident status. Uh, so we're actually looking at how this might be uh, replicated, for want of a better phrase, across GB with the other licensing authorities. More than 90 UK gamekeepers have been made redundant because of the bird flu outbreak in France. That's the conclusion of research by the National Gamekeepers Organisation, though research by online shoot finder gunsonpegs.com cast doubt on it. Bird flu hit the Loire Valley in France, where large numbers of birds are grown for the UK game bird market. The figures from the NGO reflect the impact of the cancellations of dozens of pheasant and partridge shoots. Guns on Pegs cannot find evidence of mass gamekeeper sackings, but it estimates that 70% of partridge shoots and almost a third of pheasant shoots may be cancelled. Once you start to consider the impact, the ripple effect that this is going to have throughout the rural economy and the countryside through the coming season, then I think we'll start to see those effects spread, perhaps not quite as severe, but spread a much, much wider over a, a wider group of people and businesses. So all businesses that interact with the shooting community will feel the effects of this. On a brighter note, prospects for the grouse season look good. Mark Osborne of William Powell Sporting spoke to Charlie at the Game Fair Theatre. He says that after two poor years, so far the signs for 2022 are promising. Early chicks were seen from the beginning of May. From the Highlands of Scotland to the Peak District, clutch sizes of between six and nine were the norm. Mark says it will not be a bumper year because the grouse stocks have been low over the last 24 months. 
So the moors that have got grouse in quantities of good suitable surface this year are those moors which had left at the end of last season, if they were able, a reasonable stock. That reasonable stock, if it's in good condition, and most of the grouse seem to be in good condition going into this spring, and this spring and summer has been good weather-wise for grouse pretty well everywhere. More than 70,000 people have signed a petition calling for fair play for hunters in Europe. The European Federation of Hunting and Conservation is collecting the signatures. It's concerned that policymakers in Brussels are working against hunting. The nine-point petition wants institutions in Brussels and internationally to treat hunters fairly. FACE, which represents the interests of seven million hunters, says politicians and officials are applying pressure to suspend hunters' management of large animals, where shooters are key to conservation. It claims there's an active agenda to end most regional hunting practices across Europe. It's remarkable how well and how successful the campaign is going from a UK perspective. As we said, almost 20,000 signatures from the UK already. We know uh, Basque has plans to also land these signatures with the UK authorities as well. So it's having a, a kind of a dual effect. It's, it's going to work at national level, but it's also going to ensure that international rules around hunting and conservation, which 80% of the rules affecting uh, hunting, shooting and conservation are coming from the international level. There's a new campaign to help shooters who may have mental health issues. A group of shooting organisations plus the police and Scottish Government called the Scottish Firearms Licensing Practitioners Group has released a leaflet that gives information on where to get advice for certificate holders and their families and friends. Fraser Lamb of the Scottish Association of Country Sports warns that the police have powers to remove guns for public safety if they suspect mental health issues, but claims they will work with certificate holders to explore all options. There are some times when, as I say, they're, they're, when the tools in the toolbox just, well, the police have to use that last toolbox and remove the guns just for the sake of it, right? Just to make sure that everything's all right. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that's it, ad infinitum forever, you're not getting your guns back. People get help, people get well, people recover to their their, their previous life when and are still fundamentally responsible people. So therefore, once all that's sorted, then the police will likely give the guns back. And finally, hot weather in Spain had a profound effect on one roebuck. Forest firemen from the Spanish region of Castilla and Leon found the dehydrated buck during a forest fire callout. The animal lost its fear of humans to gulp down water from their bottles. They took it to a vet and posted images on social media. Whether he survived, we don't know. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. buying shooting kits then head to kit finder and our team will help you find the right product at a fair price from dealers all over the uk kit finder the shooting kit comparison website later in the show we're big game fishing in cornwall next it's sunny so obviously gamekeeper jeff garrard is looking for his umbrella We're in a heat wave with zero chance of rain, so why is Essex gamekeeper Jeff Garrard going pigeon shooting with an umbrella? One, that'll give us a bit of shelter. Two, that'll just give us a bit of protection from the pigeons, because an open net hide, it is all right if they're decoying perfectly, but the fact is there's so much activity going on all around the place, I wanted to conceal myself as much as I could, really. They're in the wheat tram lines, they just begin to get onto the beans, they're on the rape stubble, they're on the wheat stubble. This block of land, there's, there's no hedges, there's no bushes, um, it's just a track, a track, and that's it really. We've got the M11 motorway behind us, so we can't sort of go up there. So I just thought, well, I've never done it before, so I'll just try it and, and stick it out in the middle of the field. Put the umbrella up drape my net over the top, around the bottom, just sit there, do all the shooting, virtually sitting down, and just see what happens. The area that we're on here, we must be talking about 300 acres. I've just started on the on the spring beans, which have, which have all gone off. They're landing in them, what few beans are, they're just knocking them out. 
you know, when we got here, it was a case of pigeons everywhere, just find somewhere to go and um, hopefully try and decoy a few. So we're getting a nice bit of shade from the sun, which is good. And pigeons uh, are not taking too much notice of it, which is good again. Um, and it's giving us a bit of shelter from the top from the pigeons. So uh, I'll give you a shout in about two hours time and let you know exactly how it's getting on. Just a week ago, Jeff was working alongside local farmers and fire crews as they battled a massive blaze that threatened to engulf the village. Someone had a barbecue, it caught the stubble alight, and uh, we had about four or five hours of, of trying to battle a raging inferno. It took out 200 acres of stubble, um, then got into the standing corn and took out, I think, 250 acres of standing corn. We had 19 fire appliances with us, helping us out, and two or three different farmers uh, could see what was going on, no questions about it. They just, you know, chucked on a plough and a cultivator. And if it wasn't for the fact for a couple of farmers from Mickleton um, that uh, they come in the opposite end to the fire and they were just ploughing up furrows in the standing corn, which I think was one of the things that really sort of managed to control the fire. Um, it was quite a frightening experience, to, to be honest with you. Um, when it got into the standing corn, the, the noise and the speed that it came over the hill, you'd have been a fast bloke to, uh, to try and outrun it. As from the game side of things, uh, we had to undo a pen um, because the fire was going up the side of the maze and, and looked at it the next day and it, it singed like three or four rows of maize up and it would have, well, it singed the, the pen up. So we had no option but to just let them go. They had more of a chance outside than what they would have done inside. You know, chances are that we'll probably lose half of them. You know, that's without anything that, um, you know, got caught up in the fire. I mean, we've already seen, you know, hares that just lay on the ground, just absolutely burnt to smithereens. You know, it, uh, any, any wildlife on the ground that was in the path of that fire stood no chance. So, you know, it, uh, it's a it was a devastating fire, devastating fire. Back in the umbrella hide, the action is picking up. Jeff started the day with just a couple of dead birds as decoys and adds to the pattern as we go. He stuck them out on a, on a couple of cradles above the stalks. I mean, the rape stalks are fairly high here. You know, it's been an absolute nightmare of walking. But I think it worked all right. I mean, there was, a, there was another flight line sort of like started coming from the opposite direction and they were dropping in the wheat up the end and then eventually coming on to the rape. Today is the first outing for Jeff's new Browning Maxis 2. He is shooting his favourite Ely Pigeon Select cartridges with 30 grams of number 6 shot and a fibre wad. Pigeon numbers around here have been not not big numbers. We haven't got millions of pigeons, thousands and thousands of pigeons. You know, we've got a, a nice few about, um, and if you perhaps can concentrate all the pigeons in one area, you know, you could get yourself a decent day. Um, but, you know, what we've got, they spread out quite a way. So, which is why, like I say today, you know, I was quite happy to finish up with 55. Um, I haven't got any um, mechanical um, gear, flappers, whirlers, whatever you want to call them, um, just standard decoy pattern. So I was quite happy to come away with uh, 55 today. See more of Jeff in our Gamekeeper's Diary Revisited series, link in the description below. And if you're looking to buy a Browning Maxis 2, Ely Hawk cartridges or Jack Pike clothing, go to kitfinder.co.uk. Thanks, Jeff. Next, our news correspondent, Deborah Hadfield, is off to find out about the UK's newest big game sport, 
Bluefin Tuna in Cornwall. Magnificent, majestic and massive. Bluefin Tuna swim thousands of miles to British waters from as far away as America. Bluefin Tuna migrate vast distances in shoals. They follow the food. In recent years, they've returned to the waters of the UK, especially here in Cornwall. It would appear that stocks are between three and five times the level they were in 2010, thanks to a, a very aggressive stock recovery plan that was put in place. And if you look at the last time you know, the fish were here, it was, you'd, we tend to think of it as being warm and cold cycles, but it's not really about water temperature only, because these fish can survive in six degrees to 33 degrees. They're incredible in that respect. So I think there's those long-term climatic cycles. We entered a, a warmer phase, if you like, around in the early 2000s. And then the third thing, it probably is a function of climate change. Now that's not the, affecting the bluefin directly, because as I say, they can they can be in the Caribbean or the Mediterranean in the summer, and they can be above the Arctic Circle in the winter. Um, but it's more the prey species that they feed upon, uh, their patterns are changing. The history of fishing for tuna peaked in the 1930s, when the British Tunny Club was formed. It attracted celebrities such as John Wayne and Errol Flynn. Two of the fish caught topped £850. There's a link to our film about the club in the description below. In the 50s, the stock of large bluefin tuna disappeared from UK waters. Political pundit Nigel Farage is a bluefin enthusiast. Speaking to Charlie at the 2022 Game Fair, he says a quota agreed in the Brexit deal offers a great opportunity to exploit the return of the fish. Because of Brexit... Who knew he'd mentioned that word? So, <laughs> so when the bluefin first turned up in Cornwall, and it literally was about that time, about five or six years ago, suddenly big bluefin tuna were being seen in Cornwall, but we weren't allowed to fish for them because we had zero quota, and you weren't allowed, without any quota, to even target them on Ronald Line. So we had the French, our friends, um, the Spanish, the Spanish, the Portuguese, landing about 25,000 tonnes a year into market and having a thriving sport fishery, and we weren't even allowed to target them on Rodney Line. Once Brexit happened, we became an independent registered state with the global tuna authorities, and last year was the first season we were allowed to go out and catch bluefin tuna. Albeit it's regulated, albeit it's tagged and release. Jerry Rogers of Fast Cats Fishing sails from Falmouth in Cornwall. He's preparing for the tagging season, which starts in the middle of August. He says catching a bluefin tuna is a dream come true for him. It's, it's pretty unexplainable really. It's, um, it, it's Formula One, it's Formula One fishing. Um, and to see those fish, to bring them alongside the boat, to measure them, look at them, photograph them, get your customers to see them, tag the fish and release them. It's just, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's a real bucket list experience for a lot of, a lot of anglers. Um, uh, it's, um, I mean, the, the, the noise when the reel screams off, uh, you know, your, your, your heart rate goes from resting to, you know, 160 in about five or 10 minutes. The adrenaline surge you get, you know, is huge. The fish will often take between one and 300 yards of line on their first run. Uh, you know, you, you, you don't want to be running around like headless chickens. You need to have a very, you know, measured, calm and practiced response. You're clearing the other gear. You're preparing the angler to step up. And the moment that the angler gets clipped into the harness and then the fish takes the weight, then you really know you're, uh, you know, you're, you're connected to something that's really quite primeval, incredibly powerful. Um, and it's quite an emotional experience for a lot of anglers for their first time. Jerry's customers are excited to have the opportunity to join him. He's absolutely unbelievable. Um, as a boy I'd, and growing up, would have never, ever thought it possible. And to see these fish coming in now, they have been for the last, well, at least six years. Jerry obviously knows more. Um, it's, it's great. It can only be a winner for everybody. Anglers and Skippers set up the UK Bluefin Tuna Association four years ago to campaign for recreational fishery. The Angling Trust supports the association. This year it looks like it will be the first 
a year where we have um, chart programs, tagging programs working in, I think, all four home nations. We're, we're working very closely on the English program, the Operation in 21. Uh, and this year there's an expanded English program. Uh, Wales and Northern Ireland should come on stream. We're, we're working on that right now. Scotland is doing something a little bit different. Um, but yeah, in terms of building that knowledge base um, to really understand, okay, can we do this in a way that's sort of sustainable, um, you know, economically uh, viable, economically optimal? Um, is there a demand for it? Because it's really, it's, we're setting the baseline, the foundation for can we and should we operate a, a fully fledged recreational catch and release fishery going forward. Bluefin tuna are an amazing fish. They can live up to 40 years. They're built for speed. They can dive down thousands of feet. Well, they're just the ultimate fish in the water. They're the, uh, like I said, they're, they're the Formula One fish. They're, they're the racing car of the sea. Yeah. Well, it's just the, their stature, the way they're built, the way they they move. You know, they, the way their feeding habits. You know, just they're just the ultimate the ultimate fish. Yeah. I mean, they're known throughout the world to be probably the number one sports fish or game fish that's that's targeted. Some of the tuna that UK anglers caught and tagged last year were tracked by scientists for 365 days. They discovered the fish returned within a few metres to where they were tagged. The, the chart programme in England last year, which is you know unparalleled um, in terms of the amount of information we have about that interaction between anglers and bluefin. You know, we tagged over 700 fish last year against estimates of around 250 we thought we'd, we'd tag. The tuna are, are very big, most are around two metres. Um, you get some, I think our smallest was probably about 1.4 metres, but the smaller ones are the, the rarer ones. And then we had one up to, uh, well, we had two actually at 96 inches last year. So, um, you know, these are eight foot long fish and you know, they're very big. There's no, nothing else in English waters to compare. The government has extended the bluefin tuna tagging season until December this year. It means more fish will be caught, tagged and released. It's not just good news for the scientists that track this huge predator. It also boosts the coastal communities. Plenty of bluefin. I've got plenty of bookings. I'm pretty solidly booked. I've got 60 or so bookings at the moment. Um, yeah, just hoping that it, it, it sort of kicks off early. And we get out there and you know, sort of get stuck in. It's again, you know, October is normally your sort of cut off point for fishing for charter vessels. So, you know, there's 25 charter vessels involved this year. They've upped it by 10, 10 boats. I'm fortunate enough to be one of those involved. And uh, yeah, it brings a lot of revenue to uh, otherwise, I would say, a pretty quiet, dormant sort of Cornwall. You know, it's bringing in trade for restaurants, pubs, bed and breakfasts. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's good for the county. For Cornwall and, and anywhere these fish appear, I believe it's going to be of great benefit to the local economy. Um, I know from my own experience last year, we did, I think it was 58 trips in total. Um, and anglers came down and many of those anglers stayed in hotels and were eating in um, restaurants. So the, the, um, the benefit to the local economy is immense. The future is bright for anglers who want to catch the majestic fish. The UK Bluefin Tuna Association hopes to see recreational fishing next year. DEFRA may require additional boats to be licensed and skippers to have training. I think we'd like to see a recreational fishery because this is a wonderful fishery and we would like it to be shared amongst a, a larger participating audience, if you like. It, it's not really fair, or certainly some people would view it not fair that it, at the moment it's... it's uh, limited to a minority. And of course, if we open up to a recreational fishery, it's got to be properly managed. It can't be a free-for-all. We know that these fish um, have to be taken care of. Um, they, they'll fight all the way to the boat, but very, very quickly give up. And if they're not cared for correctly, uh, they will die. So anyone who gets a license to fish, if we have a recreational fishery, must be uh, qualified, uh, at least attend a course, um, because it's important that we do protect these fish. Oh, it's massive. I mean, it's massive. It would just involve everybody. It would let other anglers come in. You know, other boats would be involved. It's just, you know, it's, it's just a magical moment, really, for, you know, a dream come true. And I'm just very, very... I can't tell you how privileged I am to uh, be doing this bluefin fishing. It, uh, it's a fish that messes with your brain. When the season ends, you can't sleep. And when you do wake up, there's a tuna running on the end of your line. It's, um, it's phenomenal. 
For more about the work of the UK Bluefin Tuna Association, you can visit their Facebook page, Bluefin Tuna UK. Thanks all who took part in that. And you can watch my full interview with Nigel Farage in the Carter Jonas Game Fair Theatre last weekend by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks everyone who came along to the theatre. We aim to put out the films of my chats and debates as soon as we can. It was lovely to meet so many viewers and especially those kind souls among you who support our news reporting by joining the Field Sports Nation. They get to watch Field Sports Extra. This week, our prize on that show is a £150 Vario earplug hearing protection setup kindly donated by Ian Hodge Field Sports. You can join the Field Sports Nation by clicking on the link in the description below, just £5 a month, and we get to tell stories on YouTube that change hearts and minds. Talking of Ian Hodge, he is the one on our Field Tester Friday film this week. Here's a taste of it. So I've just picked out two here today. Similar sort of guns, uh, different manufacturers, but good all-round guns that, that people absolutely love. I like the Maxxis. It's a gun that doesn't go wrong. It, it feeds easily. It's just a, a nice all-round gun. It handles well. But the Franchi is a new, it's been around for years, but it's new model. It's done up in this nice snake camo. It looks nice. I mean, obviously, it's going to shoot a lot better by looking nice. <laughs> <laughs> but these handle really nice. Franchi, uh, it's all a part of the, the, the Beretta family. Seven year warranty on these, so they're obviously really confident in the guns. Thanks Ian. You can watch the whole of that film by following the link in the description below. You can buy those items from Ian Hodge and if you don't feel like making it all the way to his shop in Cornwall, you can search for them on Kitfinder. Now from Shooting Kit to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is from James Washington, Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the top hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First up, Jaff from South Somerset Ferreters is decoying pigeons and crows on stubble next to standing barley, with plenty of shot cam footage and chat in the hide. Knife maker Alan Johnson from Dane and Blade sends us his latest film in which he heads to North Yorkshire just as the row rut is getting started. In Australia, RJM Hunting gets called out to a dairy farm where predators are threatening the newborn calves. He sets up on a hill and makes short work of six foxes. Meanwhile in the USA, Johnny from TGS Outdoors shoots the US Open Sporting in South Carolina, a gruelling 1,400 registered targets shot over six days with a prize fund of over £250,000. Outdoor Limits is decoying ducks on a flooded field of maize. They move when they realise they're in the wrong spot and end up getting some good sport. Brian Call is getting up close and personal with a big bull elk, calling it into less than five yards before loosing his arrow. Talking of elk hunts, born and raised outdoors are sharing their secrets with this one, full of tips and tricks for filming a hunt. It's in preparation for a film competition they plan to run next year. Finally, Lanx Firming Control has compiled a list of 20 hunting channels that are worth a look. It's air gun heavy, but nothing wrong with that, and there are some great suggestions. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click to like us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain. It's at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye.